Hello and welcome back to another session of the Young Saints Virtual Conference. My name is Kurt Frankum and I will be your host, facilitator here. And today I'm excited to introduce uh, some special guests. We have uh, Peter Vidmar and Yvonne Hubert, and they are both uh, part of the Young Men's Young Women's Advisory Councils, the respective councils of, of the host. And um, it, they, the I guess through various contacts and communications, uh, they reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, we're part of the advisory councils and you're doing this uh, virtual conference about youth and the and, and leading youth and the rising generation. We would love to be a part of it. And that's what uh, led us here. And so they have a great presentation that uh, they'll, they'll present to us and uh, I'll pass it over to you two uh, for this presentation. And we'll, uh, and then we'll come back with some questions at the end. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kurt. Peter and I are so grateful to be here today because the things that we want to share, we know are going to help our wonderful youth leaders. I want to share, first of all, a quote by our dear prophet, President Nelson. And he says, my beloved younger brothers and sisters, you are the best the Lord has ever sent to this world. You have the capacity to be smarter and wiser and have more impact on the world than any previous generation. This is what Peter and I want to share today. We want to show you how you can help these youth increase their capacity to be smarter and wiser than any previous generation. It's going to help them as leaders. We're going to share with you some patterns and some principles that will help you. President Nelson, he's invited all of us to be a part of this amazing Lord's Battalion, but the first group he invited was the youth. They have an important work to do. And this work is the work of salvation and exaltation. It's live, care, invite, unite. That's the easiest way to remember it. To be a part of this work, it's to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want youth caring for those in need and inviting all to receive the gospel and uniting families for eternity. So what is the tool to help these youth and their families in this great work? It's the new children and youth. The youth's role is to be a part of this battalion and our challenge is this new culture these adult leaders, we need to remember this new culture is youth led. These youth can do it. So this is the old program, adult led with youth involvement. This new program is youth led with adult support. And I love that adult support side by side. You're with them, helping them to be successful, to increase their capacity. These quorums and class presidents, they are called by revelation and empowered with that priesthood authority that they are given when they're set apart. Youth carry a prophetic mandate to be a part of the work of salvation and exaltation. They are joining this Lord's youth battalion. But also be aware that Satan is actively recruiting our youth to other battalions. And he's also weaponizing them. He's giving them slogans and half truths and also this passion to fight for other causes. And often these causes, we know that they are at odds and they conflict with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the children and youth, it ensures that youth are no longer just consumers. Uh, we want them to be innovators and leaders the transition for some is a little bit disorienting, disorienting, we have seen, but the results, if we are patient, are breathtaking. So how did the Savior lead? You know, the Savior called people and men from all walks of life. He called fishermen, he called tax collectors, and, and he knew how to reach out to each one individually in a very special way. And as leaders, you might need to reach out differently to each one of your youth, knowing that each one is different. They come from different backgrounds. They come from different uh, family situations. Uh, some have full developed families and 
some maybe in uh, single parent households. And so as a result, we need to be sensitive to each of their needs and each of their circumstances. Um, but the, the Savior, when he led the 12, he, he called them to, uh, to be his disciples, to be his apostles. And he led them in a specific way. Now, when I was a, uh, served as a mission president, my wife and I back in 2016 attended the mission president's seminar for new mission presidents. At that seminar, Elder Neil Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles gave a remarkable presentation about leadership and leadership style and how we can help uh, our missionaries to become leaders themselves. And I think these principles apply as we help our youth to become leaders themselves. And so um, let's look, if we look at the horizontal axis that we see here of this slide, it represents the degree of love felt by the youth from from their leaders, from low love to high love. And the vertical access represents the, the degree of expectations for young leaders and their classes and their quorums. Now, I know this model is simple, but there's great power in high love and high expectations. So let's begin by, by linking faith in Jesus Christ to the expectations on our vertical access. So higher faith in Jesus Christ and higher expectations, and then down below, lower faith in Jesus Christ and lower expectations. Uh, almost all wards, I think, will find themselves on that right side of that vertical axis. The, the low right corner represents a ward with an abundance of love, with all of its wonderful effects, but maybe without expectations to reach with faith in Jesus Christ. We, we see maybe fewer spiritual goals, uh, maybe a little bit of stretching, but maybe not as much as we could have. And we have love and we have friendship, but we don't see a lot of miracles uh, in, in those types of interactions with our youth. Now, the upper right corner represents a youth quorum or class where we create a culture of high love as well as high expectations. And here we find more trust in the Savior, more sincere finding, more prayerful goals, more spiritual power, and certainly more miracles. Uh, I, I taught this, this diagram to our mission leaders in the mission to try to help them to lead like the Savior did and to lead their fellow missionaries like the Savior did. And you can do the same with your class or quorum presidencies in your wards. Now, as we follow the example of the Savior, uh, we can better magnify our love, our expectations, uh, and our missionaries' faith in, in Jesus Christ and cause a greater flood of miracles. We, we want to we meet them where they are. As we said, every one of them is, is different. We want to we personalize your expectations of each young leader. Again, they're all different. Invite them to have greater faith in Jesus Christ and be generous in acknowledging their progress. It, it's easy to, to catch someone when they make a mistake but sometimes it's more important and it's, although it can be challenging, is, is to try to make sure we catch people doing something right. Catch our young people when they do something well, praise them. They're gonna, they're gonna seek uh, those, those positive words and that positive feedback and they'll become better leaders as they lead with love and as they have higher expectations of themselves. So youth leaders, what can we learn from the Savior's example? Let's follow a beautiful story of Jesus with the blind man from birth that's found in John chapter 9. I would encourage you to study this. There is a pattern here in the story. Think about how this noble man, he was led from expectation to expectation, allowing him to build his faith and trust in God. First of all, the Savior met him where he found him. And then he said to him, go wash. He didn't preach to him. He didn't teach or he didn't correct him. The man had a need. The blind man did as Jesus directed and a miracle happened. He was healed. The blind man recognized that Jesus was a man that a man had healed him. Eventually, the man recognized the Savior as a prophet. And then I love this next part. Jesus later sought him out because he knew he'd grown from his experiences. 
And he said to him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he replied, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe? And Jesus said, It is he that talketh with thee. And the man replied, Lord, I believe. Jesus met this noble man where he was at the very beginning, and he realized his specific need. And then as the man grew, what happened? As he expanded his faith and capacity through his experiences, the Savior raised his expectations for this man. And I love this pattern that the blind man first saw Jesus as a man and then as a prophet and then as the Son of God. And the New Testament is replete with Jesus's personalized, customized invitations. Remember to Simon and Andrew, he said, come ye after me and I will make you become fishers of men. Uh, to other disciples of John the Baptist, he implored, come and see. And to Nicodemus, the Pharisee and the member of the Sanhedrin, his invitation was to be born again. So what invitation will you give to your youth to come to the Savior? Um, you'll do what Jesus did. You'll want to meet them where they are. You're going to want to personalize your expectations of each young leader. You're going to invite them to have greater faith in Jesus Christ, and you're going to be generous in acknowledging their progress, giving them that pat in the back that they, that they need, and sometimes they're, they're genuinely seeking. So what does this look like today? What do we learn from the Savior's example? Each youth will come with different experiences, as Peter mentioned earlier, and I want to show you a little demonstration. Okay, some youth, um, they will have stretch capacity about like this rubber band. Other youth will have a little bit more stretch capacity in doing some things, and others will have lots of stretch capacity. Now, different young leaders have different stretch capacities, but the same youth, they may have different stretch capacities at different times. For instance, they may feel so confident in conducting, but when it comes to counseling, maybe they struggle a little bit. And so we have to be aware of those, of where their stretch capacities are and what we're asking them to do. So also be aware of their stretch points. It will look different for every young man or young woman. And these stretch points, they highlight where there are opportunities to nurture this growth. We want them to, to increase their capacity, remember? So we need to challenge them and stretch them beyond their current capacity. But don't require too big of a leap or they will become overwhelmed and some may even disengage or give up. I saw a presentation of this with the rubber bands once. One sister was doing this and literally as she was doing this, it flipped the rubber band clear across the room. And I thought, yep, that's exactly what happens with the youth. If we stretch them too far or give them too much that they're not ready for, they're out of here. They're gonna run. And so we want to be side by side and help them and support them through the stretch until they are able to do it on their own. Now, after they understand what's expected of them and how to do it, that's when we as leaders have to step back and let them try, pray for them, encourage them. Through their trial and error, they all will gain useful information that's gonna help them to learn from their mistakes and from their successes. I know for many years, I was a flute teacher for about 25 years, and I just wanna share with you a little example of some things that I learned. And if you could compare this to you as a leader of youth and how this applies to teaching a class presidency. So first of all, it was really important when I had a student come in it was important for me to hear them play. They had to be playing the flute so that I knew where they were. I had to acknowledge also what she did well. I had to be generous um, so that it would give her hope to work through those things that she didn't do so well. And then when we practiced and worked on those things that she was struggling with, 
that was my opportunity to increase her capacity to be able to play the music better. There were some key things that helped. First of all, repetition, and then practice. And then also little tricks that I had learned to be able to help her. There were many times when I would be teaching a student that I had tried to get everything out of the bucket of tricks that I had and it just wasn't working. But then I would be impressed upon to look at a finger or check this or try this. And we would change that little teeny thing and then she was able to play that phrase or the breathing was able to be better. Um, I was amazed how much the spirit helped me and encouraged me to help these flute students because the Lord wanted them also to increase their capacity to be able to play better. I also, not once in my whole career of teaching, did I ever at a performance or a competition, did I ever run up on stage and say, okay, there's this one phrase that you have always struggled with. Let me just play that phrase for you and then you just keep playing. Um, not once did I ever do that. And that would be ludicrous if I did that. I think sometimes as adult leaders, we want them to succeed and want success to look like we want it to look. And so we try to jump in and do it for them. We really need to be side by side and help them so that they can learn to do this on their own. We as leaders need to get on our knees. The Spirit will guide each one of us to know what is best for that youth to help them grow in their calling. I really believe that if the youth fail, it's because we fail to prepare them. Thank you, Yvonne. Let, let's take a look at this slide of these beautiful priesthood holders and, and look at the quote, the development of an LDS religious identity largely depends on the quality of certain relationships. I'm sure that those flute students learn so much from, from Yvonne simply because they knew that she cared for them and that she loved them and that that relationship was special to them. Well, the same is true as we lead in the church. Um, these relationships are, are sometimes critical for a young man and young woman's testimony. You know, I don't remember who won the Academy Award in the last 10 years in any category, but I do know the names of my three seminary teachers, Larry Johnson, Justin Tolton, and Janice Tate. They had a huge impact on me because I spent a lot of time with them in the early mornings in California as a seminary student. And uh, apparently the average uh, time of service for a young man's president in the past in a ward is about nine months. Not a lot of time to develop a real relationship. And so with the new changes that we've seen uh, in the last couple years, in particular with a bishop, for example, as the young men's president of a ward, you can see how that's important in helping a bishop to establish a relationship with the youth because a bishop serves for much longer than nine months, typically about five years. And this gives him a chance to build a relationship with the young men and young women of his ward. And as a result, they get to learn more about the gospel of Jesus Christ from someone with a rock solid testimony of our savior. And they in turn become closer to the savior. So understand how important time is to these young people understand how important relationships are to them because you will have a tremendous impact on them and on their testimonies as you simply spend time with them and as they know that you care personally about them, their own goals and aspirations and their path in coming closer to the Savior. Uh, thank you, Peter. It's amazing how those relationships from our leaders that affected us as youth, all of us can remember those of this special seminary teacher or young woman or young men leader or a bishop or somebody who impacted us and connected us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. These youth need that. They need a peer, a leader or a family member or hopefully all to be able to be the support system that connects them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. As you mentor, you create these valuable relationships. You know them well enough and you love them well enough that you can have higher expectations 
for them. It's important. I love this quote by President Nelson. He said, we need to let the young people lead, particularly those who have been called and set apart to serve in class and quorum presidencies. Priesthood authority will have been delegated to them. They will learn how to receive inspiration in leading their class or quorum. I am so excited about this idea of letting these youth lead so that they can learn to receive inspiration. I wanna share with you an experience I had several years ago as a youth leader. I watched this class president who was terrified to stand in front of this whole audience of parents and young women and be the conductor of this program. Well, I helped her a little bit beforehand with this outline that we had of what was gonna happen at the program. And as we were working together and she was practicing doing this outline, I said to her, I said, you know, I said, you know, if by chance, you know, during this program, something happens where maybe after a musical number, you feel that you want to share your testimony or share some thoughts, you know, that's okay. I was trying to teach her not just to stick with the outline. And she just said, oh, no, 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 Sister Hubert, no way. I am holding on to this outline. This is what I'm going to do. And I said, that's fine. That's fine. No worries. I just, just think about it. Well, when the program came, it was amazing. She was nervous as can be, but she did it. She did it and she was in front of a huge audience and she was, you could tell she was just nervous but excited. Well, it came to a part in the program where this, this sweet class president, after one of the parts of, I can't remember, it was some musical number or something, but she felt to go away from the outline and she started sharing something and I watched her countenance change. And I wanted to say, does everybody see that? She, she went away from the outline. She's, she's following the spirit. And the real joy that came afterward was seeing her face as she came to me and she said, Sister Hubert, did you see that? Did you see that the spirit came over me and I just knew what I had to say and it was so easy. It was then that it was not about conducting. It was about this youth learning to listen to the spirit and to receive revelation. The, you, the Lord does not have an age stamp on revelation. Even the youngest leaders, they are entitled to receive this revelation from the Lord. And we want to encourage them to ask and to seek and to knock. Let's look at this next quote by Jeffrey R. Holland. Elder Holland says something really simple we underestimate their ability and overestimate their experience. Isn't that a powerful quote? Let's look at the next slide. We must not inadvertently release these youth who have been called and set apart and given delegated authority to serve in their callings. This last week, I talked a little bit with Sister Michelle Craig, and she shared with me a part of an email that was sent to her that I want to share with you as youth leaders. And ask yourself if, if this is happening in your wards. She says, I am a 12-year-old and am in Young Women. Last summer, I was called to serve as a counselor in the Younger Presidency. When I accepted the calling, I was expecting to have presidency meetings and things to be done according to the handbook, which I read personally preparing for my calling. And then I was called and nothing happened. We never have presidency meetings. My heart was broken when I read this. I thought, oh, what a missed opportunity to be able to help this sweet, excited young woman to be able to grow and to have a good experience with her first calling. My question for you is, how can we as a leaders help them engage and increase their capacity, setting a pattern for the rest of their lives? And the way that we're gonna do this is we need to train them. We need to train these youth to be leaders. 
and you have some wonderful resources available to you. And I would invite you even now, or maybe at the conclusion of this uh, presentation is to take out your phone and to go to Gospel Library and to go to Youth and then go to Helps for Presidencies. And you'll see some wonderful resources to help your young leaders in your wards. Um, you're probably already familiar with this, but there's a really good onboarding experience for a new presidency as they learn some lessons on leadership. Um, there's an orientation guide that a member of the bishopric can conduct and teach um, for a new presidency. And then there's also a sample agendas and there's five leadership lessons. The first one is preparing for and conducting meetings, teaching these young people to have meetings and to hold and conduct meetings. Then there's one on counseling together. There's one on the work of salvation and exaltation. Remember to live, care, invite, and unite. And there's one on planning service and activities. And there's tremendous uh, resources on activities and service opportunities on the website as well. And then one finally on ministering and helping these young people to reach out and minister to their fellow quorum or class members. I was sitting in a, um, in a meeting. I occasionally I, I visit with um, priesthood uh, presidency meetings and I was at a uh, presidency meeting with a, a bishop who was the president of the priest quorum and his two assistants and their secretary. And I sat in on a meeting with them uh, oh, a few months ago. And uh, this inspired bishop uh, allowed these uh, young men to lead, to conduct this meeting. And he would just throw some questions in there to get them to ponder and to think and maybe to feel the spirit. At one point he said, you know, who hasn't been coming uh, lately? And uh, one of the uh, assistants spoke up and said, well, you know, Bob has been coming for, for a little while. And, you know, he's just kind of fallen off the map. And he says, well, how can we get him back? And then there was silence in the room. And this gave these young men a chance to feel the spirit. And one young man spoke up and said, you know what, Bishop? He, uh, he works at an auto body shop. He loves working on cars. Maybe we could have him come to, a, um, to an activity night and teach all of the core members on basic car maintenance. Maybe he'll come to that. And they said, the bishop said, that's a great idea. What can we do about it? Another young man raised his hand and said, well, I know him fairly well. Why don't I invite him, bishop? And so now you could see these young men working together to minister and to help and bring the young man back, uh, back into the fold. And uh, they had planned this little activity. And I followed up, actually, a, a, about a month later. I said, hey, did that ever happen? And they said, yeah, he came. He came. He taught the lesson. And they were able to kind of re-engage this young man with the quorum. This was entirely led by the youth. Now, the bishop did a wonderful job planting seeds in their minds to, to think and to ponder. That enabled them to feel the spirit and then to create this opportunity to bring a young man back into the quorum. And, uh, and, and these lessons are a wonderful onboarding experience, especially for a new presidency. So these lessons might take 15 minutes to teach, maybe 20 total, maybe the first five weeks that we have a new presidency. Um, those first five weeks, um, there could be one lesson taught each week uh, to help them uh, really kind of get into being leaders in their quorums and in their classes. Um, and so they can be very, very effective. And I'm gonna talk about presidency meetings in just a moment, but let's take a look at a little video that was produced uh, by the church on, on can conducting uh, presidency meetings and classes. Hey there, I'm so glad you chose to click on this video. It probably means you're part of a young woman class presidency or ironic priesthood quorum presidency and want some help with your meetings. Am I right? My name is Isabel. And for the next couple of minutes, I will walk you through some tips and ideas on how you can get your presidency meetings running smoothly. Let's go. These meetings are for planning how to accomplish God's work, and you get to lead out in this great work. You'll discuss the needs of members of your class or quorum, plan activities, and so much more. Okay, that's just a little taste of what this video has to offer. It's a little longer than that, but for the sake of time, know that these resources are available to you and to help uh, your presidencies to get on board with, with leading. Now, just a, a little... I guess a, uh, an invitation to all of you 
to, to be frequent with your meetings, to actually have weekly presidency meetings, to make sure that your presidencies are meeting uh, on a weekly basis. You think about a bishop and a bishopric and how often they meet. They all meet at least weekly. I know that stake presidencies meet weekly and it's simply because there's so much to do and there's so many people that need help and ministering to. As a result, the same should take place in a, in a quorum or class presidency meeting. There's so many uh, young people that can be reached out to and, and blessed and, and ministered to. And so um, some things can't wait. They can't wait for a month. There, there have been various studies and polls taken amongst uh, groups of young men and young women uh, leaders and advisors. And, and here's some of the I would say the average response that has been received when this question is asked, how often do your class and quorum presidencies meet? 22% in this one uh, poll that was taken of 142 attendees, 22% met weekly, 40% uh, met once a month, 17% uh, twice a month, and you can see 5% quarterly and 16% as needed. And uh, I would say that uh, this is kind of how most of the polls go as we survey different uh, groups of uh, young men and young women leaders in, in the church. But we strongly urge you to have them weekly. They don't have to be long meetings. They can be 15 minutes right before an activity night or right after an activity night or right before the two-hour block on Sundays or right after the two-hour block. But weekly meetings are strongly, strongly recommended. We, um, I did a training with another member of the uh, General Young Women's Council uh, in, uh, to a large group of stakes uh, in a certain part of Utah. And uh, I got a phone call from uh, a stake young women's president after our meeting. She said, uh, Brother Vidmar, I just want you to know that I, I have a, a, a stake of about eight different wards and six of my wards, their young women's meet, young women's presidencies meet weekly and they're thriving and uh, we're not losing any of the young women. But I've got two wards where they almost have no presidency meetings or they're waiting for COVID to go away and then they'll get on board and we're losing so many of the young women. And there's power in presidency meetings where these uh, youth leaders who are in tune to their friends. They're in tune to the fellow members of their classes and quorums. They know what's going on and they know who needs help. They know who needs to be ministered to. And sometimes um, you can't wait for a month to discuss their needs. And if we discuss needs weekly, then lives will be touched and we'll see miracles happen. Peter, I love that. I was talking with Sister Corden last week and she told me that um, the young men president before, President Lund, which was President Owen, had mentioned also that same thing that he felt as he went and visited all of these different wards every week and saw those young men who were thriving. He said that there were two things that he saw. They had weekly presidency meetings with an agenda. And so there is something to that. I hope that you leaders will think about that of why, why it's so important for these, these youth leaders to meet weekly with each other. I want to now share a video of Elder Tad Callister. He shared this with us in April 2019 conference and it's about three minutes but it has some powerful teachings in it that are going to help you. That's going to help you as youth leaders. While serving as a mission president, I observed that there was a dramatic increase in the spirituality and leadership skills of young men during their mission years. If we could somehow quantify these qualities over their ironic priesthood in mission years, perhaps they would look something like the line you see on this graph. In my mind, there are at least three key factors that contribute to such dramatic growth in the mission years. One, we trust these young men as never before. Two, we have high but loving expectations of them. And three, we train and retrain them so they can fulfill those expectations with excellence. You leaders lift these deacons' quorum presence best when you let them lead out and you step back from the spotlight. 
You have magnified your calling best not when you give a great lesson, but when you help them give a great lesson. Not when you rescue the one, but when you help them do so. There is an old saying, do not die with your music still in you. In like manner, I would say to you adult leaders, do not get released with your leadership skills still in you. Teach our youth at every opportunity. Teach them how to prepare an agenda, how to conduct meetings with dignity and warmth, how to rescue the one, how to prepare and give an inspired lesson, and how to receive revelation. This will be the measure of your success, the legacy of leadership and spirituality you leave ingrained in the hearts and minds of these young men. If you deacons quorum presence will magnify your calling, you will be instruments in God's hands even now, for the priesthood in the boy is just as powerful as the priesthood in the man when exercised in righteousness. And then when you make temple covenants and become the missionaries and future leaders of this church, you will know how to receive revelation, how to rescue the one, and how to teach the doctrine of the kingdom with power and authority. Then you will have become the youth of the noble birthright. Leaders, do you trust the youth? The Lord does. Do you have high expectations and loving expectations for them? The Lord does, and he has prepared them. Please train them and love them and minister to them so that when you are released, the leadership in you will be in them. Let's look at this next slide. This is my friend, Messy Jack. At what age do you stop feeding your child and why? What does it require of you? And why do you let it get so messy? Now let's look at the next slide, and this is why. How happy is Jack? Because he did it all by himself. Jack was successful, and it looks different than if we had done it ourselves. Success is based on where these youth are coming from and what they have learned. I love 2 Nephi 28, 30, and it says, For behold, thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, and blessed are those who, re who hearken unto my precepts. Remember that growth takes time and practice, and patience and love. We all know that. We want to conclude now with a video from our dear Elder Bednar. He shared this in Roots Tech of 2020, I believe, and he lets us know how important it is that we let these youth lead and the miracles that will come. We have confidence in you. You are the Lord's battalion. And these adjustments that have been made now organize the work of salvation so that it is so focused and so simple. We know, we witness, we testify that you will contribute to helping great things happen in this work all over the earth. We expect you to surprise the adults. We expect you to seek inspiration and revelation. And as you do that in your youth, in a world that is increasingly wicked and ever, make, ever more chaotic, we promise you, you will be safeguarded, you will be guided, you will be protected. What you learn about receiving revelation about others will bless you in magnificent ways. I've seen that video from Elder Bednar many, many times, and I feel the spirit every time because I know how much he loves the youth, how much he knows the capacity of the youth that are in your warts and what they can do. And all we have to do is let them lead, give them a chance to feel the spirit, give them a chance to receive revelation and to exercise their priesthood, 
and to exercise the authority that's been delegated to them to bless the members of their quorum and classes. Uh, what, a, what a privilege it is to serve in this capacity and this calling. Um, I know uh, that the general uh, young men's presidency, the general young women's presidency loves the youth of this church dearly. And prayers are said constantly on their behalf. And we're so grateful um, for such wonderful leadership. And I know how much they love the youth and I love the youth. Um, I've seen the development and growth of my own children in the gospel through gospel programs. I know that um, scouting is gone and personal progress is gone, but the children youth program is the program that is needed today and that it comes from the inspiration of those that are leading us from living prophets. And I know that this will bless our children and our children's children. I'm just so excited to be a part of it. Awesome. All right. Are we going to questions here? Sure. Okay. All right, I'll get to the right screen here. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you. That was uh, so I can tell you put some some time into that and prepared it well. It means a lot that you do that for, for this audience. And I found it very much and in, very informative and, and whatnot. Um, so let's just I just have a few questions maybe we can discuss and, and see if there's more we can learn here as far as like, you know, uh, Sister Huber, I appreciate the, the rubber band, you know, visual because that I think a lot of us can almost identify each youth that we lead with the specific rubber band like, oh, that that with that individual is pretty the tension's pretty strong. And with that one, wow, it seems like I can give her anything to do and she'll just hit a home run every time, you know. And so sometimes there's this balance of, well, what if what, what happens when the rubber band does break or like you said, it flies off and it's sort of out of control and and we we're constantly trying to gauge like st stretching them but not too far is there any examples that come to mind as you've maybe uh seen different youth groups around the world and how they're doing it how what what uh advice would you give to youth leaders to make sure they don't stretch them too far who wants to jump on that one you know that is a really good question <laughs> because we don't know and that's why we have to have faith in the Lord as a leader, that he will guide us to know what to do. There's been many times where I've seen youth leaders, you know, they're a little bit hesitant. Oh, we don't want to push the youth. We might break them. And I think it's the opposite. Yeah. I think we need to have higher expectations for them and pray and get on our knees and help, ask the spirit to help us to know how we can help them and lift them. Um, those youth, I think, who do are expanded, who are leaving, we need to be there with love. We really do. We need to be there with love and be side by side with them and help them and bring them back. So to me, it's yeah. it's just having faith in the Lord and following the Spirit as a leader. Yeah. Peter, anything you'd add there? Yeah. You know, um, I, I think sometimes there's, there's kind of a, a habit in the church of of uh, asking that really capable young deacon, for example, to serve as the deacon's quorum president. And he does a great job and he's got some good counselors and you've got some that maybe don't show that that real leadership, at least outwardly at first. And so we, we neglect to call them to those assignments. And we move on and now this young man that was a, t a deacon is now a teacher. He becomes the teacher's quorum president. And then he becomes the bishop's first assistant. And there's others that are kind of off to the side that never really get that chance to lead, to become leaders. And as a mission president, I could see young men that would come out to the mission field who I knew they had lots of leadership experience in their quorums. Um, and, and young women that have had leadership experience in their you know, young women's classes. And then you could see others that never really got that chance to lead. And so when you assign them to be a district leader or a zone leader, that there's a bit of a struggle there because they've never really been um, given that opportunity to lead before. And so my recommendation is to do all we can to include every member of the quorum, every member of the class, give them all leadership uh, responsibilities, give them all assignments where they feel like they're in charge of something. And yes, uh, just like little Jack, it can be messy, but uh, but they'll they'll learn that they have capacities they never knew that they had. And you'll see them blossom into wonderful leaders and that'll bless them on their missions. It'll bless them in school. It'll bless them in the workplace, in their homes. And so let's give every young man and young woman a chance to have a responsibility. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I, I appreciate that 
sort of getting in that frame of mind of like, let's start the the leadership journey now rather than on the mission, right? We hope that everybody maybe has that desire to go on a mission and, 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 you know, regardless if you're in official role as a leader on your mission, you're leading in some capacity and that experience as a youth, if we start them young and put that faith in them saying, all right, you're probably going to drop the ball. This is going to be hard. And I'm going to be right here, you know, with that high love and high expectation. Um, then we start them on the path where they're going to have a much more successful mission, knowing that, they feel capable in stepping forward and leading. Right? And even with all the leadership they may have had before, entering the mission field is an intimidating experience. It really yeah. is. And so this will help prepare them even that much more. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I should maybe forward some of these emails to you as I, as I get them. You know, I, obviously, leading saints are trying to create content around or in the context of leadership. And so we get different questions about specific leadership in the church. And, um, Oftentimes they'll say, I'll get an email a lot saying, what are bishoprics doing out there to, with this new shift of, you know, the, the higher focus on the youth. And I think everybody intellectually, we, we grasp the idea, but in application, it's gotten really un unclear, right? Or be, we revolt, revert back to some old habits of just saying, well, yeah, we're doing the, we're sort of the young men's presidency too, or whatever, but we sort of pick up on those old habits. Any advice that you've seen? this far along in this new youth initiative and approach that uh, would maybe help Bishop Ricks or the, the youth leaders? Maybe if I could just speak on behalf of for yep. Bishop Ricks is that um, a bishop should not be his father's bishop um, or his grandfather's bishop. Um, I, I would invite anyone that's listening to listen to Elder Cook's talk uh, in April of 2021, and it, where he gives a heartfelt talk about bishops. You could see the emotion in his voice. You could see the, the tears in his eyes as he shared his love for bishops and all that they have to do. But there really needs to be a cultural shift. And he explains that in his talk about how an elders quorum presidency and a Relief Society presidency can and should shoulder a much greater uh, load to help the bishop with regards to ministering, to counseling, and doing things that really the bishop does not need to do uh, just because of his calling. And so that he can have more time with his own family and more time to spend with the youth. And I think that over time we'll see that cultural shift, but it's a bit uncomfortable at first because we've always looked at the bishop as the guy that does everything, that he's the go-to person in the church or in the ward. And there's many more wonderful resources in the ward. The bishop's storehouse is more than commodities. The bishop's storehouse is also people. And the bishop has many people that he can um, enlist and, and ask to help and assist uh, various other members of the ward. Uh, these other individuals who, who aren't in the bishopric uh, might have special skills that could really bless the lives of another member of the ward. And, and I also realize that you, you listening here and watching this program could be uh, leaders that come from tiny branches that that maybe only have one or two or three youth in their entire unit. And so, of course, they have to make some adaptations. But even there, if the bishop had spent time with the youth, they're going to build that relationship with him, the spiritual leader of the ward, and their testimonies will grow and they're going to grow, grow closer to their savior. Yeah. Yvonne, anything you'd add? I would love to add something. What kept coming to my mind as Peter was sharing was, revelation and respect and knowing that these youth can do it. Um, we have to get, get out of the, the past of, of the way we've done things. And sometimes it's so easy to go with, oh, I've been in young women's or young men's for 15 years and this is what I know and this worked. And so I'm gonna do that because I know it worked before. We really have to respect that the Lord has given us revelation through a prophet. He said, learn how to hear him better and also let God prevail in your life. And the more we get better at doing that as leaders, the spirit's gonna teach us the new way to be able to lead these leaders, to mentor them and help them to be able to do it. So I'm, I'm curious just from the standpoint of young women's presidents, you know, I think with this new shift, sometimes the bishop or the bishopric can be hyper focused on the youth. You know, there's that shift that's happened, but maybe they overcompensated and now the young women are feeling 
you know, I mean, I, I can't get the bishop to focus on, on what we're doing. And, and so I don't know if there is a practical response to that or any thoughts coming to mind, Yvonne, as far as how we can make sure that the bishoprics aren't being too preoccupied with just the young men. Ah, oh, that's a really good question. I love it when I hear that bishoprics have sacrificed and made the time to go to young women camp. Um, they will get to know those young women in their wards. I also love it when I hear that, that they go to the activities, that they make an extra effort. I understand that, that yes, they are over the young men, but they are equally over the young women. And I know the spirit will guide those bishops to know where they need to be. Awesome. I'm curious, what about, um, you know, so we're speaking, we just touched on as far as bishopric involvement. What are you seeing as far as what's working with uh, parents' involvement in this youth program, right? It's, uh, sometimes back in the day, it felt like you could just send your kid off to, you know, mutual and on the Wednesday night and know that they're taken care of and they'd come home and talk about these activities or whatnot. But any advice or, or what's working as far as uh, involving the parents? Kurt, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, this is a home-centered church. Remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and this should take place. The bulk of this work should take place in the home. Uh, I invited the leaders to take a look at the at all that's available in the Gospel Library app for the youth. Well, the parents should be looking at that with as much enthusiasm, if not more than the leaders, to see how they can sit side by side with their own child and help them with the children and youth program through gospel learning and service and activities and personal development, the three areas that are focused uh, on our youth. Again, the purpose of the program is to help the youth to grow in the way the Savior grew, as in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So any parent, any young leader, young man or young woman's leader wants their youth to grow in all these areas of their lives, intellectually, spiritually, socially, physically, and the home is the best place to do it and to start. And at the same time, be sensitive that many homes are might be different and uh, and there might be a greater need for a, a leader or an advisor to step in and, and assist where the resources for a young man or young women may not be as full as they could be. Yeah. Yvonne, anything you'd add to that? Or? I just love how the Lord set it up to help everybody. There are those strong families that are home and that are doing this, that are making goals with their children, that are having gospel learning opportunities, that are doing service and activities as a family. But he also has the young men and the young women leaders to be able to help those that maybe don't feel that support. And so the Lord cares about every youth. Yeah. And I appreciate th that perspective. Um, you know, just being aware that each home is different and there's different, um, responsibilities, different limitations, you know, maybe Johnny has, you know, set a certain goal or whatnot to be outdoors more. And, and his dad loves that and takes him hunting four times this quarter where Susie's dad maybe travels a lot and her mom has two jobs. And that's just, it's not that one home is better than the other. There's just different circumstances that are limiting that. And so it's, it'd be easy to think like, well, it seems like Johnny's figured out this youth program, but Susie just doesn't get it when in reality, there's just so much to consider and you have to have a lot of patience with that. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and these, these video clips that you showed, are they, especially that first one, uh, are they available on the, the youth website or in the gospel library app? Is that? No, <laughs> no? <laughs> some of them are available. Some of them aren't. Um, you can, I, I know that people could even use them from this podcast if they wanted to, they wanted to download yeah. them, but we did get them approved so that we could use them here. So if people want to download them here, that's fine. Okay. I'm just trying to anticipate the questions that I'll get. So if they're not available, that's fine. But people can obviously replay them here. But um, one, they need to look at the look at the website. Look at Gospel Library. It's it's yeah. amazing how much content there is on Gospel Library on the Children and Youth Program. Uh, I think that in many cases we have uh, leaders, we have bishoprics, we have stake presidencies that are surprised when we introduce them to the abundance of content available to help. Uh, them and to help youth and help them in their homes and help them in their callings. Yeah. And that awesome. video, that video on the four 
not the four, but that video on the presidency meeting where you saw that wonderful youth saying, yeah. here, come into my presidency meeting. There are actually four videos and you will find them under those five leadership lessons. So Peter mentioned you go to the gospel library and then you go to youth and then go to helps for presidencies and you'll find those five leadership lessons and you'll find those, those four videos inside those lessons. Awesome. That's really helpful. Um, Peter, you mentioned something as far as the average, something like the average, uh, or at least it was with the young man's president, the average length of a calling was about nine months as the young man's president. Um, do you feel like there's been more of an emphasis or maybe has, has that been communicated to bishops to make sure that we're not, you know, rotating these youth leaders out too quickly? I know a lot of that sometimes with moves and job transfers and things that's sometimes out of their control, but um, it sounds like th there should be an emphasis on making sure when you call somebody as a young men's president or, or I'm sorry, a young, a young men's advisor, that it's a, it's a long-term thing. Well, it is. And that's why it makes sense that the bishop uh, with this new program would be the young men's president because he'll be yeah. in there for a while. Um, now, gotcha. it was never intended by our leadership in the church that there would be fewer uh, adults assisting our young men and young women, that there'll be fewer advisors. Certainly there's room for many advisors and for many specialists so that we have an abundance of talent that's helping to nurture the young men and young women. But uh, it, it would only make sense that um, the two things that make the biggest difference is keys, right? The bishop has keys and he can delegate keys to his youth leaders and a, a, a teacher's quorum president has keys a teacher's quorum president has keys, and the other one is relationships. And so we want to lengthen those relationships, broaden those relationships, and deepen those relationships so that these young men and young women can uh, be taught and nurtured by um, people that can really help them in the long run. I, I still, I'm still in touch with my old seminary teacher, Larry Johnson. He's had a tremendous impact on me. Uh, and I, 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 I cherish those relationships and they've made me a better disciple of Christ. Yeah. Yvonne, anything you'd add to that? Or? I do. I just want to add one little thing. A little red flag went up. We have to be careful too, that we don't add so many adult leaders that we don't allow the youth to lead. That the, the adult leaders that are yeah. added are making sure that they are being a support, working side by side, and training and helping these youth lead instead of taking over. Yeah, that's that's a uh, really helpful. There's sort of a balance there, right? You you, yeah. you think, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna just supercharge the youth program. That each you know class is gonna have six advisors, and then uh, then people are then there's no room for the youth to step in, right? So yeah. sort of just sort of gauge that depending on your ward and and the yeah. youth. And that's yeah. another way the youth will be disengaged is because if there's too many adults making comments or too many adults being involved, they'll step back every yeah. single time. And so if you see that in your ward happening or your branch happening, it may be that there's too many adults in there, you know? And so really be prayerful as leaders to know what is best for these youth to help them become youth leaders. There, there's a balance to be found. Yeah. You, you, can, you can throw the young person into the deep end and say, hey, you're on your own, or you can keep them in the kiddie pool in the shallow end and do it all for them and kind of find that middle middle place in the pool where they can get the assistance they need, the guidance they need, but they can genuinely, genuinely learn to lead. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, you, you touched on uh, these weekly meetings, you know, this being stressed more and more of making sure there's a weekly presidency meeting. Um, and I, I love, you know, Yvonne said that it, it's happening weekly and there's an agenda. I'm curious, uh, sometimes uh, there's this, uh, lack of understanding of where to go with, you know, we, we meet so often that we feel like, man, we've talked about everything four times over, but are there, are there specific questions or agenda items that generally you feel like, um, a presidency could, could at least visit once a week, even if it's a, a short five minutes or less meeting? Yes. And there is on the app where it's help for presidencies, there are sample agendas of things that will help them to know what to do. One of the things we are doing as an advisory council and the general presidency is we are training new stake young women presidencies that come in. And one of the things we do in our training is show them 
what these young women presidency meetings could look like. In fact, one of them, if there's only 15 minutes, they don't have to be long, they can be short and they could even be on Zoom. Um, but if one of them, they just focused on the council together section at the beginning of Come Follow Me, where you had your class presidency and they looked at the lessons that were coming up and they thought, hmm, what is a good question that we can counsel together with as a class? Because if you notice at the beginning of this Come Follow Me, it has a section that says 10 to 20 minutes of counseling together. And we would really love to see more youth being involved in that, learning how to counsel with each other. As I was studying this and learning about this so that I could train these wonderful leaders, I received a witness how powerful it's going to be for these youth in a safe place, learning how to counsel and talk about things that matter. What kind of mothers are they going to be? What type of roommates are they going to be when they go to college? They will learn how to solve problems and talk about things and respect each other. It is such a powerful part of our Sunday lessons. Uh, Peter, anything that you'd add to that? No, uh, Yvonne is absolutely on target. We, we want to give these uh, young people a chance to meet, to become leaders, and th they'll surprise you. They'll surprise the leaders what they can do, what their capacity is. And we've heard stories of young men and young women saying, hey, I got this. And wouldn't that be great to hear that more often? I've got this. I yeah. know what to do. And it may not be perfect, but that's okay because nothing I do is ever perfect. That's for sure. Yep. Awesome. Well, this has been fantastic. And, and I love this, the emphasis that <laughs> I think it's so, you know, the old joke is if you want to hide something in the church, you put it in the handbook or whatever. And now it's, if you want to hide something, you can put it in the gospel library app. It's all there, right? Like let's just con constantly encourage people to go check out the app and uh, make sure you just know every, you know, I've got it pulled up here and there's just so many, uh, you know, options to to dig into and discover and, and resources to make sure that we're visiting again and again. Cause if we don't, that's sort of when we revert back to these old habits of thinking, well, this is how we did it when I was a youth. So this must be right. You know? <laughs> and so this, this is great. Well, uh, last question I have for you is well, I'll just, I guess, ask for your, your, uh, your final thoughts. Uh, and if you want to share a testimony, that'd be great. And Peter, we'll start with you and then we'll end with Yvonne. So. I'll just share a brief testimony that I know that this, uh, children and Youth Program is inspired uh, by the Lord through his servants, and that as we apply this program, uh, which is different than programs of the past, that we'll gain a testimony that it is inspired, that we're in a living church led by a living prophet, that Jesus Christ is at the head of this church, and he knows what our youth need the most. And as we stay on that covenant path, as we hear him, we're going to know how we can best assist and help the youth in our wards. I love the Lord. I love his church. I know it's true. And I leave this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Last night, I was at a fireside. And as I sat there surrounded by these amazing youth, my heart warmed again. They are capable. I just know that. I know that the Lord has prepared them for everything and anything that they will face right now. I also know that the Children and Youth Program is the tool to help them today in their families and in their wards. I am so grateful for the opportunity to be able to share with leaders around the world how I feel about the youth, about the program, about the Lord. And I know that if we all get on our knees, the Lord's gonna continue to give us more revelation and to help us know what these youth need. I am grateful and I do know that this is the Lord's church. I also know that um, through an experience that I had a while ago that the presidencies that are called, they're not called because they love the youth only. They're called because they listen to the Lord and it is the Lord's church. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that I've had to see that and witness that. Um, I love the Lord, and I know that this is His church, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.